So, uh, my name is Medavi Thankapan, and I will be chairing the Wednesday seminar today. And to get us started, I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and community. We pay our respects to the people and cultures and the elders past and present. Today we meet in Ngunnawal country, home to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. So um, again, welcome all. Uh, welcome to people uh, who are here in the Ragged Theatre at Simonston and also to several of you who have uh, joined us online from different locations. So welcome to the third term of Wednesday seminars. Today we'll have Lanwe Wang sharing the story of how Geoscience Australia and the United States Geological Survey work together on the Landsat satellite program. Lanwe graduated from the University of New South Wales with a Master of Science before starting at Geoscience Australia in 1999 as part of the graduate program. Since then, he's worked on a number of programs and projects. Um, he's worked on the Australian Geographic Reference Image, or AGRI project, which was a significant project and uh, still continues to uh, be uh, of use to a number of our collaborators across the globe, that particular product. He's worked on analysis-ready data workflow development, and more recently he's been working on the data processing and archiving system, or DPAS, with colleagues from the United States Geological Survey. The topic of today's talk is cross-continental collaborative coding, the story of two geological surveys and an Earth Observation Data Processing and Archiving System, or DPAS. So, please join me in welcoming Lanway to the podium for delivering the talk. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining today's uh, Wednesday seminar. And uh, my, my talk today is about the cross continental collaboration coding the story of two geological surveys and Earth observation data processing and archive system. Okay, so my talk will today my talk will cover the, the story of the history of Landsat in Australia. We will briefly talk about three key collaboration uh, areas that benefit Australian users. Then we'll move on to the exciting Landsat Next program. Then we'll talk about the Landsat data processing archive system. And finally, the collaboration, deeper collaboration, challenge from deeper collaboration, and how we work together. First, Landsat. What is Landsat program? The Landsat program is a series of Earth observation satellite uh, missions jointly managed by NASA and U.S. Geological Survey. The archive since 1972 is the longest, uh, the world's longest continuous collection of space-based space uh, remote sensing data that, that we have today. And Australia has been there since the beginning of Landsat. The copy on the right shows that uh, it's from uh, Sydney Morning Herald in July 1972. It shows that uh, the Landsat data it directly shows that Landsat data how Australia can use Landsat data for different applications. And in 1979, Australia ground station in Ice Springs started to receive the data for, 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 from Landsat. At that time, a large stack of floppy disks was sent out to customers. I joined GA in 1999, and when I joined, we sent our city rounds to the customers, and now everything is online. It's a big change. Here are the key Landsat dates in Australia. In 1972, launch of Landsat 1. 1979, we have the Landsat ground stations, the ice springs starting receiving the data. In 2003, 
the data processing archive system is released to Lanza International Cooperators. In 2008, US, uh, US announced the free and open Lanza data policy. And in 2010, there's a Lanza Global Archive Consolidation Project, double the size of Global Archive. In 2013, Lanza enters the Guinness Book of Records as the world's longest opera operating Earth observation satellite. It was designed for three years, but it lasted for 28 years. In 2016, tracking telemetry and command TTNC duties has added to iSpring. So we're not just downlink data, we also uplink the command as well. And in 2022, Geosense Australia starts permanent DPaaS development team. This picture shows the density map of the historical, from historical acquisitions. As you can see, Australia is the only continent with a 2,500 image deep time series because of the ice cream ground station. The second collaboration example I'm going to talk about is the, is how we improve the geometric accuracy of landside products over Australia. At around 2010, uh, Geosense Australia initiated a project to produce geographic, Australian geographic reference image, or AGRI, from ALO satellite. And we provide feedback to UAGS regarding this less accurate landside controlled over Australia when compared with AGRI. UAGS compare and assess AGRI and confirm the superior accuracy of AGRI. And then following on that, they implement a new control to align with AGRI and release the product or well, the collection one release in 2016. At around 2020, UAGS released a collection tool. The collection tool has a few enhancements, including improved geometric accuracy. And as you can see from this picture, this is a global offset between collection one and collection two of uh, Lanza products. In this picture, you can, you can see that Australia is all in green color, which is represent only zero to 12 meter differences when compared with collection one and collection two. And this table shows the, it's from Lanza Technical Working Group shows the, the offset in figures between collection one and collection two. And as you can see over Australia, it improved from collection one, 7.2 meter to 5.5 meter. This is sort of very, considered very small, considering the 30 meter pixel size for Landsat. So not many users are aware of this, but Australian users has been assessing the most accurate Landsat imagery since collection one, compared with other uh, users from other countries. Okay, we have talked about the geometric corrections. Now we move on to the, the third collaboration example, which is focused on radiometric correction. Here we will only focus on the correction for bidirectional reflectance distribution function, or COBRDF. Sorry for the long term, but essentially this is about where the sun is, where the satellite is, and its effect, its effect on the reflectance on the ground. Uh, if you imagine that you have a light source, like a, like a torch. If you move the, the light source up and down, close or far away, the same things on the ground will show brighter or darker. And similarly, if you move your view angle a little bit away, that you're going to see the things bright, slightly brighter and darker. And this is the similar principle as satellite observations, that when we have sun at different elevation and satellite at a different view angle, it's going to also affect how we see on the observation on, uh, for, for the for SAR data. So based on after the VRDF correction, our data are all normalized or standardized to a fixed sound elevation angle and satellite view angle. By doing this, this is very important that when we apply for multi-temple applications, because the data were acquired at different for the uh, sound elevation and different uh, some view angle, so, sorry, uh, sensor view angle. So this is the effect after VRDF correction. 
This picture shows on the right is after the VRDF correction. This is the adjacent uh, scenes, uh, the adjacent uh, scenes over the adjacent path. And as we can see that there's no visible boundary on the right hand side. And on the left hand side is the one that without VRDF correction. So GA has offered VRDF corrected products that support us since 2014. And through collaboration on radiometric correction, VRGS is planning to release VRDF corrected products for collection three before the end of the decade. So it's coming. And with the improved geometric accuracy and radiometric accuracy, we aim to provide high quality uh, data that meeting Australian needs, uh, also improve the user uptake and apply high impact science applications. Okay, we'll go through some uh, key collaboration areas. Before now, we move on to Landsat today and Landsat next. Currently, uh, land imaging and earth observing data has been used by uh, have been used extensively by government programs. It is used over 170 programs in Australia, most of which use Landsat. And uh, this sector is growing rapidly on track to hit 700 billion US dollars by globally by the end of 2030. So lots of data has been used for different applications there. Back in March 2024, a media release announcing Australia intends to partner with the United States in relation to the Landsat Next program. So due to this, with increased funding, we are going to read increase the GAD pass staffing resources to support UAGS D pass. On the left, you can see that the Landsat legacy time frame from 1972 up to now for Landsat 1 to Landsat 9, different satellites. So why it is called Landsat next? Why is it not called Landsat 10? Let me explain. This is why we are so excited about Landsat next. It has improved temporal, temporal resolution. There are three identical Landsat next satellites as a constellation. And this means that it improved the revisit frequency. Instead of having 16 days revisit like Landsat 8 or Landsat 9, you have 16 days, so, so you have six days revisit. So the same place placed on the ground every six days. Also, it improved the spatial resolution. It increased from the 30 meter pixel resolution from Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 to 10 meter resolution on Landsat Next. It also improved the spectral resolution. Landsat Next have 26, 26 bands. There are 50 more bands than the previous Landsat 8 or Landsat 9 mission. So with these 26 bands, there are 11 bands that align with the previously heritage Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 bands. There are five new bands that have similar spectral, spectral resolution to be able to compare with the European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 mission for five bands. There are also 10 new bands that is meeting the user requirement for new applications there. So with the improved temporal resolution, improved spectral resolution, and improved spectral resolution, that also means that there will be a significant increase in data value. As shows in this picture, if we compare Landsat 9 and Landsat Next, that Landsat 9 will collect around 900 gigabytes per day, and Landsat Next will collect 8.2 terabytes per day. So that's a huge amount of data compared with the previous missions there. So there's going to be lots more data for Landsat Next. That's where we have the enhanced deep pass to handle the processing. So what is the data processing archive system, or we call it DPASS? Essentially, it's a series of subsystems that enable end-to-end -end Landsat processing. Uh, this is a new DPASS architecture uh, graph diagram that UAGS is moving from the on-premise processing to cloud processing. And uh, 
there's lots of lots of different subsystems in this diagram. I won't go deep into this scary diagram. Instead, there's a simplified diagram that just showing the flow through of what actually happened there. On the top there, we have Elmac, the Landsat Mission Operations Center, who will schedule the acquisition. And on the left, we have ground station which to receive data and then going to transfer data to cloud. It will go through a series of processing like interval assembly, ingest, port generation, and eventually send the product to the end users. Some of them go to archive and the UHS uh, end user portal and also uh, Indo Pacific Data Hub uh, portal. Right? Another com big, uh, important component in this uh, architecture is that the IS, the Image Assessment System, this system will monitor the sensor health and also generate calibration files that will be used for processing purpose. So in a nutshell, this is what the DPAS is doing, basically schedule the acquisition, collect the data, and do the processing and deliver to the user. Timeline and goal of the DPAS collaboration. In 2003, the system is released, the code is released to Landsat International Collaborators. In 2008, there's a free and open Landsat data policy. In 2008, GI processed around 10, uh, 12,000 of Landsat 5, Landsat 7 things in a year. In 2010, there's a Global Archive Constellation project. In 2022, we start permanent DPAS development team. In 2024, Justice Australia DPAS team, recognized by UHS as within US DPAS moderation project for Landsat Next. And we are capable of processing around 3,000 Landsat things in under an hour at our testing prototype AWS infrastructure. So we we'll go through all the details of DPaaS, and now we're going to move on to, in terms of what are the, uh, how we work together and the collaboration challenges that we are facing. There are a few challenges with this collaboration. The first obvious one is the time zone. UHS Earth Resource and Observation Science Center is located at Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and it's around 15 hours behind camera. And uh, we normally have uh, 8 a.m. weekly meeting, uh, 7 a.m. monthly meeting, and ad hoc 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. meeting. And sometimes the time is just not ideal. For example, a 2 a.m. meeting, so we will request for a recording of the meeting, and then we will follow up at a later time. So the time is a big challenge there. Also, programming languages. GM mostly use Python, and UHS mostly use C and C++. Fortunately, fortunately, our Python developers are so good at C and C++, and UHS is also moving some of the coding scripts to Python as well. So there's a, a trade-off balance there. Also, tools are the, there's also other challenges in terms of the tools that we are using and in terms of security. For example, some of the documents need to have security clearance before it can be shared with us. So, yeah, there are a few things that need to be noticed here. In terms of communications, we can access to each other's teams. Uh, for example, that our daily stand-up message, it is visible to the so two UHS colleagues shown in here as a screenshot example there. We provide daily send out message so that people are aware of what we're doing. We have the weekly tag up to review progress on different task items, information exchange, playlist, all the things, and we're all recorded on UHS conference page. And we have recorded meetings, as I mentioned earlier, if the timing is not that ideal. And this is a screenshot of an example of our weekly progress uh, discuss meeting and all recorded on conference page. So 
in terms of collaboration, how does Australia and the US share code for DPaaS? This sort of flow chart sort of briefly describe how it works there. On the left hand side, we have the UAGS internal repo. So everything is the same for UAGS. They push the latest change that is called to GS to, to code.uags.gov where we have access. It's an automatic mirror, so theoretically that all the updates will go through to code.uags. So GOV, where we have the access. When we receive a new task, it will record it on a Jira ticket. We, we will start a feature branch, and we will work in the feature branch. After finish, we will raise a merge request and ask for review. And uh, after we receive review, review we will refine until it is finally accepted by UHGS. So once the code is accepted by UHGS, UHGS will merge it back to their internal repo, whatever they wish. And after they merge back to the, the internal repo, so very soon that because the automatic mirror that the code the the code base repo at code.uhgs.gov will also get updated as well. And there's minimal sort of impact on the internal process. UHGS still maintain their own project management process, the existing QA review process, and that affected by this additional sort of flow here. This is how we share uh, the code and de deliver the, the work back to UHGS. GATPAS team are now on UHGS Jira system to, so that they can assign the task and have a status of resolve across the ticket. We are the only non UHGS team in the program, and this is an example of one of the Jira ticket. Now I'll go through a few uh, output examples that we deliver to UHGS. The first example is a metric reporting prototype that we deliver to UHGS. Uh, and uh, as you can see that the original report was developed in on the uh, Zen a PHP on the Zen framework, which is enterprise framework, and uh, UHGS tasked us to test it out on Python with the open source Angular framework as a proof of concept. And here is another example of a prototype example of heat match generation in terms of the data acquisition density. GA also participated in UHGS DPATH validation primary design review, PDR, and critical design review, CDR. We review key materials and participate in milestone reviews. Here is a screenshot example of GA's prototype work I've been shown in one of the critical design review slides there. Other examples here, GA developed a prototype to explore Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 on demand level 1 generation. As we know that Landsat next is going to sort of come out with lots lots of more data and it's going to be a significant cost if we store all products on a disk, the old business model may not be sustainable. So a potential solution is that a mixture of on-demand processing with some of the more recent acquisition, like the last three months or like six months, data that's available, always available on the disk, but the older data could be processed from process on demand by uh, efficient way of storing some processing metrics when we process the first time, so that when we process the second time or the third time, that the processing time case will be significantly reduced. So that's one of the, the prototypes that we, are, we have been delivered. Also, uh, GA has performed multiple infrastructure supports for UHS AWS. An example is to provide recommendations on technical solutions to manage sensitive information such as password, credentials, encryption keys in the cloud. It has been implemented in the implementation there. And as mentioned earlier that we are in UHS Jira system and here is a list of supporting tasks that we have, we have delivered to UHS. The list lots of them is related to some infrastructure support for AWS, 
some of them related to some cocaine up and some of them related to some prototype work that we delivered for USGS. So, in summary, the GS DPASS team is now the only non US development team supporting the DPASS modernization project and has been supporting the US for more than two years now. It, yeah, DPASS collaboration has moved from, let's see if it works, and going back to USGS to now become a day to day collaborative education development. It's a, a more a VAU sort of process now. Our goal is the one seamless DPASS team who is still not there yet. For example, we cannot assess their AWS environment yet. So there are still a few obstacles there, but we are continuing to try to continue improving in terms of our collaboration. Collaboration wrapping up further because of the new Lancet Next partnership, that new more data has come coming and uh, more enhancement on DPASS is required. This collaboration will ensure Lancet data meets the needs of the Australian user community and provide inside details of the development and operation of DPASS. Thank you for your attention. That's the end of my presentation.